So when Nuzuku Munna leadership asked that I be part of the committee to organize these activities around 50 years of the end of the Nigerian Civil War, I did not anticipate that I would end up being drafted onto a cool keynote role. When that turned out, being alongside Professor Wale Shoyinka, the first thing that struck me was that the two biggest victims of fake news in our part of the world were being asked to engage in a highly nuanced project. <laughs> I thought, so much fake news is going to come from this. Yes, we are at war in public conversation. The theft of identity of others whose names then get used to say things others want to say is so pervasive and few people, unfortunately, so much targets as the two of us that it requires some a priori disclaimers. In recent months, I've, been, I've seen conjectures credited to me then generating ad hominem barbs and tirades from agents of those who think those created stories affected their interests. In fact, what I have found that that is tragic for our country is that many times they come from officialdom. They come because people anticipate that you will take a position on something that is coming and they are afraid that your voice will mean something. So they want to devalue the position you could take. And they create fake news around you to create a crisis. And then they begin to attack the effect of that fake news. It is not an accident that some of the most profound discussions of the public sphere focus on virtue of people who play in public life. One of the most important conversations, I think, in political uh, thought was offered by Baron Montesquieu. We often remember him for the uh, points about separation of powers and how he influenced the making of the American Constitution. But Montesquieu's biggest contribution for me is to say that virtue is a requirement to play in public life. Um, one of the finest political scientists to ever come out of Nigeria, in my opinion, Professor Peter Eke, who headed the Department of Political Science at the University of Ibadan for several years, who sadly has been living outside of Nigeria for more than 30 years now, wrote one of the most important essays from Nigerian political science, The Two Publics, in 1975. And Peter Eke's conversation is focused essentially on morality as a necessary ingredient of playing in the public sphere. In my own work, I've referred to values. When a nation is generally headed in a direction by people who are lacking in those, that nation is in crisis. And we must not allow our country to go that way. And so, uh, let me uh, begin by proceeding along the track we've set for ourselves. Um, when Professor Shoenka expressed frustration on these matters, I said to myself, well, how do we go about throwing light in the face of darkness struggling to encompass us. I would like, therefore, to, pay, to begin by paying tribute to the human spirit which allows broken men and women to overcome the anguish of war and conduct new lives after that war. With the Nigerian Civil War, there were saints and there were sinners, and there were heroes and they were traitors. It is not possible to talk about the war without talking about the kind of emotion that came out of a stage across from here, the other hall, when the musical Kakadu 
was staged. I think it's a fantastic thing that the musical Kakadu was written by a lawyer who talked about the fine points of life in Lagos and the onrush of the Civil War. I think we must encourage the staging of Kakadu as part of the celebration of 50 years of the end of the Civil War. But I remember cries of pain and gratitude in Surulere, in Lagos, where I was when the war ended, as I got ready to return to school in Ibado. People returning from after fleeing Lagos nearly four years earlier, realizing that their Yoruba neighbor had rented out their house and dutifully saved the rent and paid them that money as they returned, changing the 20 pound scenario as a tribute to the human spirit. And that is what my Nigeria is about. Gratitude in all things to the Creator and human solidarity, which allowed foreigners from far. French doctors like Bernard Kuchner, who would become foreign minister of France. I am fairly certain, almost, that I met Bernard Kuchner as a doctor in Biafra. Not on any level. I was a young person, and there was a sick relative who was treated by a group of French doctors. One, the particular one that was treating uh, this relative was a black French doctor from Martinique, but in their group must have been Bernard Kuchner. After the experience, Kuchner would of course start Medicines on Frontiers, Doctors Without Borders, to deal with these matters. The global charities like Caritas, with their neighbors far and near, who helped ameliorate miseries almost unprecedented in human experience. But that was the war. Why does it matter to reflect on that experience and 50 years since it? I think initiative was, has value because war is horrible and anything that enables people learn enough from its experience to make them seek not to repeat it does humanity a great favor. Allied to this, is the managing of the cessation of hostilities which determine how people heal and whether it is easy to capitalize on old wounds or not. How we end wars matter. War creates a psychosis and it can affect culture in a way that people may not even begin to think about but it's real. I'll give you a funny example I always like to refer to. Most people who are old enough will know that the stereotype of the Igbo man before the war was of a very modest person, of a man who wears a short knicker, his singlet, and his bathroom slippers, walking around the market, and then a car knocks him down, and you discover that he has one million pounds under his pillow. That was the Igbo man before the war. The post-war Igbo man is one who is voluble, very, very showy. <laughs> How did we go from that image of the Igbo man to this image of the Igbo man? The psychosis and the realities of how war affects people. I have many theories on this, but this is not the day or the time for it. We also need to reflect to determine why war has brought scientific and allied commercial material progress to many societies because of the scientific gains of war. We saw how the Americans appropriated German scientists and German science after the war, in addition to its own, to lead to America's post-war commercial expansion. But we look at Nigeria and see how little we gained from the science of our civil war. And we've got to ask ourselves questions. 
These are the kinds of matters that we should be interrogating. I say frequently that the most primitive public sphere is one which instead of focusing on issues, um, focuses on ad hominem trading of insults. Something that has continued, unfortunately, to dominate our, our space. But I think that we have to face the reality that one of the lessons that we do not seem to have learned from the war is how to manage public conversation. If you go on social media today, you will know that Nigeria is at war. I mean, young people who were not anywhere around the war hate so much, and you wonder why. For me, this is a failure of leadership in Nigeria. And I, I'm quite often asked when these barbs come about at the personal level, and they hit. Professor Shinka talked about how he learned to ignore them. Uh, for me, it's very, very simple. I have a fundamental philosophy that says that I'm actually absolutely nothing but for the breath of the Creator in me. In fact, if there's any measure of value in me, it is something that flows essentially from a sense of what I consider is my pursuit of my place in the nature of being a human being. Uh, so it is easy for me to ignore being called names, but not many people can do that. Those who cannot do that, take those insults in, in a way that leads to the kinds of tensions that lead to war. How do we manage a culture that is so infused with this anger and this, many of it comes from people not having the capacity to have rational conversation. Because they can't discuss rationally, they don't have the information, the education is so poor that they can't take on the issues they choose to insult. So we must begin to educate our people better. And that can elevate the public space. <laughs> now let me turn to a really emotive thing. Um, the word genocide is a coinage of the 20th century. In fact, it entered the lexicon, our lexicon, from reflections on the Armenian experience in Central Europe, Turkey, and such places. But the Nigeria, Nigerian Civil War did produce perhaps the second worst genocide in numbers of the whole 20th century, which was a century of genocides. Now, I will tell you an embarrassing personal thing for how I engaged this subject. Embarrassing because it is completely out of line from the Biafra experience. In 1996, I was writing a book titled Managing Uncertainty, Competition and Strategy in Emerging Economies. I took a sabbatical leave spent it at the Harvard Business School working on this book. And the more I looked at the environment of business, the more I realized that the government was the most dangerous object in the environment of business. Business is failed more because of government in Nigeria than any other cause. In fact, the model um, that I offered from structural economics um, the so-called structure conduct performance paradigm. And I, I, I took one that is uh, famous, the, um, the one offered by the Harvard Business School professor, Michael Porter. And I said, if you play this as a basis for determining outcomes, performance outcomes in Nigeria, you would completely be lost because the night before something, one minister speaking to one guy on the tennis court can make a decision that completely blows your investments. So 
the model I created, which was called the 3E framework, had as the overhang what I call the predatory acts of public officials. So I thought to myself, there's so much poverty in Africa that so many people are dying because the environment of business is unfavorable, is not enabling. There must be something that is done. But in African countries, governments or people in power are so powerful that nobody really begins to engage these things. What normally checks these things? Human nature is that way. Strong institutions. But how do you build strong institutions? Incidentally, I had just met Douglas North, who won the Nobel Prize uh, from his work on institutions, institutional change, and economic performance. And I thought to myself, African countries need supranational institutions above the country that can help reduce some of the challenges of the environment. And so I began a campaign for international criminal courts to try African leaders for impoverishing their people by the kind of economic policies they offered and for carrying out acts of genocide. And then I found there was an international movement already, so I joined in. As I was going from newspaper to newspaper, making presentations as to why this kind of law needed to be so, so, uh, supported in the United States. When I arrived to go to school in the United States in 1978, I met the Africa editor of the Christian Science Monitor, a guy called David Annabelle. And from our conversations, he encouraged me uh, to contribute to the newspapers. Just a sense of irony. When I first, the first day I met Dele Giwa, he said to me, oh, I read your piece in the Christian Science Monitor about Ujuku's return to Nigeria. I just located in the irony of our conversation today. So I wrote to the monitor editors. I wanted to come and make a presentation on the idea of an international criminal court. And when I came there, one very cold morning in January of 1997, after my presentation, the editors of the Christian Science said to me, look, I was too idealistic that this would never happen. International criminal court for economic crimes for genocide, it will never happen. Less than 18 months later, in July, I think, or June of um, the following year, the Rome statutes were passed that brought this International Criminal Court in the Hague. <laughs> but what was uh, interesting for me was that in carrying that campaign, I actually did not think of what I experienced in Biafra. I was thinking about economic genocide that were being carried out by people who, because of corruption and their other self-interest, were diminishing their people, destroying the dignity of the human person across the continent. Having faced this reality that I was onto something much bigger than I should have been thinking of when the Statute of Rome passed, I began to reflect on my own civil war experience. How did my civil war experience uh, begin? And by the way, part of the reason that I gave, rationalizing after the fact now that I didn't think of the civil war, was that a movement was taking place in international political arena. Um, the kind of state that Professor Shoinka described that African leaders held on to is an evolution from the end of the 100 years religious wars in Europe that led to the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. Now, the Peace of Westphalia, which created the modern nation state, had all these doctrines of non interference and non so on and so forth. But after the genocides of the 20th century, the Armenians, of the Jews, fundamental human rights became central. The declaration by the United Nations began a new movement. It was only creeping in. By the way, if the Biafran war was fought today, there would be no Nigeria. Because the mood in the international community 
now accepts self-determination as a doctrine. But thank God that we have a chance to build in Nigeria. Because there's a lot more that can come from in Nigeria if we're honest to one another and build a proper. So how did my civil war story begin? It's a very intimate, personal story. Uh, I told a bit of it on television last night. I was returning to, my father worked for British Petroleum. It's a town in current capital of Zamfara State, I had a tank farm, Guzo. My father worked there, and I was returning to Guzo by train, arriving one Sunday morning, the last Sunday in May of 1966. As the train pulled in, station was completely deserted, nobody inside. I thought, what? This is strange. It's not. I got out of the train. Across the road, I could see my father's blue Peugeot 404. And then I looked closely away from the car. Somewhere by the corner was my father. He was carrying a double barrel gun. And he had his bullet. I said, is it, you know, I had seen Rambo then. I would think he was playing Rambo. But I thought he was going hunting. I wondered why he was going hunting that early in the morning on a Sunday. And anyway, he waved me across. And I got in the car, and he drove off. And he started telling me what happened. Earlier that morning, rioting had started. My mother and my siblings were in church, a lady of Fatima Catholic Church in Buzo. Rioters had invaded the church. My mother's arm had been broken. The hospitals were too dangerous to have anybody. And so they'd taken the family to um, the home of a family friend, who was the manager for the Barclays Bank there at the time. His name? He will become Minister of Information under Shagari. So, in Garba Wushishi's place, I was covered. Doctors came to treat my mother and all of that. Uh, and it got worse. Okonkwo, uh, Ofia Julu. His father was the leader of the Igbo community in Guzo. Dambeki, he was killed that night. No, the next night. When everything escalated. Dambeki. <laughs> and, um, and so we all ran to the airport. My father made contacts, and um, BP sent a light aircraft to come and take us out, like a 10-seater aircraft. So when the aircraft came in and we were leaving, you can imagine hundreds of people desperate to leave, and this one family was going. People were running after the aeroplane as we went to take off. That was my first vivid image of the nature of that kind of crisis. Anyway, when the Civil War started, I was in Christ the King's College in Onisha and went through those early days in Biafra. And at some point, crossed in a canoe at night, the Niger, into uh, the Midwest, which was war theater, war theater. A few weeks before, soldiers entered Asaba, and people were being killed for exercise. And the people of Asaba got together and said, okay, you know, let's show that we are warmly welcoming these troops. So in their Otogu, in their finest whites, they came out to dance to welcome the troops. And the women were ordered to this side, the men were ordered to this side, and they opened fire on the men. A friend of mine survived that Thousands were killed. A friend of mine survived that by playing dead under the weight of the body of his father and his brother. He was lying underneath there. Now, these stories are not meant to um, make anybody get upset, but to say that if you don't deal with those kinds of things, in a chat with General Gowan, uh, I speak very frequently with General Gowan. Uh, he was in Asaba a few weeks ago, and the issue was raised again. It was the third time was in Asaba that this issue was raised. And General Gowan, I don't know if he would like me to say this publicly, but anyway, maybe I shouldn't. Uh, he, you know, he, he really did not know what happened in Asaba. He didn't. You know, um, 
Anyhow, so when I crossed to that side, that had just happened. And at this time, my people were all living inside the bush. Nobody lived in the town. And my grandfather chose not to run into the bush. World War II veteran in his 70s, what was he running from? And one young soldier saw him, I said, what are you doing there? He said, what can I be doing here? And he used him for target practice. And his body was left in front of his front porch. Um, interesting thing that as we were coming out of the bush, we were, put on quote, captured by some soldiers. And again, men to this side, women to this side. Then another group of federal soldiers arrived and said to the, the ones that had captured us, what are you trying to do? And they started fighting. Let me be sure that the human conscience, at some point, things begin to separate. And anyhow, uh, we ended up in St. Patrick's College as refugees. Uh, as it turned out, the battalion commander, Nathaniel Nasamu, Lieutenant Colonel, was a friend of my father's. A couple of weeks later, I was in Lagos. My father was in Lagos, actually, during that, all that time. And my civil war ended. But this is an interesting part. I tell this story because I want to raise this part. After I got to Lagos, life was so good. We were partying. James Brown was happening. You were really happy in the neighborhood if you could show that you had Papa's got a brand new bag or whatever it was. Uh, uh, um, we did not know that a war was going on just a couple of hundred meters down the road. That is the feeling that I have when I see people talking about the Northeast today in Lagos. There are some Nigerians killing each other somewhere in the Northeast. Human solidarity and our shared humanity is the most valuable asset that man possesses. And to lose it is to lose everything. And so that civil war experience uh, leads me to ask myself repeatedly, why did we not do enough to learn from it? But more importantly, it leads me to a big question to ask myself, why do I never feel bitter about the Civil War? I've never felt bitter. I, I'm not sure. I, I can say this as a boost. It's hard to find many Nigerians who are more Nigerian than myself. So why don't I feel any bitterness? I've struggled to try and explain it, but I, I think I can provide a couple of explanations. Uh, first of all, General Gowan's leadership after the war was very, very important. General Gowan, true, truly in his heart, believed there was no victim, no vanquished. But whether the implementation of the policies led to that happening is another matter. But those kinds of efforts, thank you then, Top it up with the Shagari disposition. Picking somebody from that part of the country to be his vice president. And then I somehow got lucky. Young fellow coming back from grad school, thinking he could change the world. And then I get identified by that vice president. And one day he says to me, hey, President Shagari, uh, yesterday approved for you to replace Professor Denigu, and I said, what does that mean? And I end up in government. And from my office in Dodan Barracks, uh, most of us don't remember, but President Shagari was a chain smoker, but he never smoked in public. And he respected the office of the president so much that he never smoked inside that office either. So to smoke, President Shagari would come out to smoke. And I would come out, and Abadabo and I will corner him and start chatting him up. And I saw a true nationalist in that man, that history and the newspapers probably will not capture enough. Had the Shagari mindset resulted in an Ekwame presidency in 1987, the ghost of Biafra would have been buried permanently. But that was aborted in 1983. However, just to summarize my thoughts, I was making the point that the trust between stakeholder groups, including those who govern and those who are governed, in point about that, uh, noted here the problem of a very cynical youth. Um, 
could be managed if we educate people properly. But we don't teach history in our schools. Um, how do we change that? I think that a great part of this problem has been a matter of leadership failure. I recall being interviewed two days after the coup d'etat of December 31st, 1983, by the New York Times correspondent Clifford May the third. In that interview, I said that those who threw out the Sagari government may discover one day that they may have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. I don't think anybody's in doubt that Nigerian governing has gotten worse progressively since then. There's also the point that comes from the Balkans. Whereas in the Balkans, hatreds from communal feuds can go on for a thousand years with vendettas, civil wars, generation after another. Many in Nigeria quickly forgot the horrors of the civil war because of the conduct of men like General Gowan and men like Alaji Shehu Shagari. Are we going to be able to redeem our future, to draw from what we lost? And I'll move towards the close now. Lessons from 50 years after Biafra for the new Nigeria. The critical question is why does Nigeria wobble so badly in spite of experience that should be driving it forward and what can be done about it? I think we can list the reasons to include one. A mistaken view that Nigeria is about how much you can extract from the national cake. A cake to eat makes poor tomorrow, but producing makes rich always. Check the example of Spain in history. Spain thrived as the conquistadors brought back hordes of gold from Latin America and elsewhere. But today, Spain is one of the poorest countries in Europe. And countries that were not anywhere near as endowed as Spain have much quality, higher quality of life. Nigeria has refused to become a producing country because it has a, an elite that is steeped in extracting rent and in getting a share of the booty. And so we're not creating wealth as a country. And we're not educating our children, investing enough in them to lead to further creation of wealth. Merit matters. Nigerian, Nigeria's essence, sadly, has become about the democratization of mediocrity. Affirmative action that some are educationally backward has been abused for excessive cronyism, which has devalued Nigerian institutions. I can give you a capable Nigerian from any part of Nigeria, but those who live in the excuse that some places are less uh, endowed from a human point of view, use it to bring cronies that are thoroughly, totally, completely incompetent to head positions in our country, devaluing our institutions and making progress with the world. The collapse of culture, which has reduced human purpose to primitive accumulation of power and money, and often a criminal privatization of the commonwealth. Four, the loss of a sense of principle of subsidiarity, that government and authority be decentralized and move to levels closest to the people. A distant government in some far off place like Abuja, Alausa, or Enugu creates a moral distance in civic culture, which Peter Eke captures well in the essence of his essay, The Two Publics. The overburdening of people by an expensive and pompous government. Governments need to be cheaper, simpler, more ethical, and more sensitive to extant circumstances. Governments in Nigeria are too big, protocol, too unbelievable, and it seems like that we are creating a government of politicians, for politicians, by politicians, rather than a government of the people, for the people. 
thinking, learning, and projecting and planning state is imperative. And the ground norm needs to be rewritten. The political party system is totally flawed and a complete failure. Nigeria cannot make progress with the kind of political parties that we have today. So to conclude, if the ghost of Biafra is not to return and does not have to come from the southeast, some books, I saw Chido this morning, some books, titles are telling here. Chido Numas tells us we are all Biafrans now. Another tells us that in Biafra, Africa died. If the ghost of Biafra, which can rise from frustrated youth in the southwest, Niger Delta, and several parts of the north, who were first to call for a breakup of Nigeria in those words, Araba, Aware, Bamwaso, American soldier. If those are not to become so spread that Robert Kaplan's fear in the book, Becoming Anarchy, does not become real. There is a duty that each and every one of us has. It is a duty to believe that it can be different and that if we can dream it, we can make it happen. I thank you. Thank you.